In this podcast, we will be discussing sensitive topics such as sexual assault. It's important to take care of yourself while listening. Some suggestions are listening while you're in a healthy headspace or knowing who you can reach out to if you become upset. Our 24-7 helpline for crisis calls based out of Central Florida is 407-500-HEAL. For the Florida State Sexual Helpline, call 888-956-7273 by contacting the national hotline at 1-800-656-4673. You can get support and learn about your local resources. There's always someone ready to help. Welcome to the Victim Service Center podcast. Here, we sit down with professionals and serve survivors and victims of trauma or those who have experienced violence and have conversations about social issues. About social issues. This week, we are talking about how to take back your power after a sexual assault. My name is Hannah Jennerine. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Education and Prevention Coordinator at the Victim Service Center. With me today, I have Natasha, who is a sexual assault survivor. Natasha, thank you so much for joining me today. Can you please share with our audience a little more about who you are and what you do? Hello, Hannah. Good morning, first of all. And I want to say a huge hello, hello to all of our listening audience. And I'm very excited to be here with you and share my traumatic experience that have impacted my life and the life of many others alike. I am a mother. I'm a Christian woman. I'm a wife. As a professional, I'm an occupational therapist who work with adults and children. My background um, is in psychology for my undergrad degree and my master's degree is in occupational therapy. So I've worked in uh, various settings um, and today I'm here to share with you that in spite of all my achievements in life, that I've had a rough beginning, but by the grace of God, I'm still here today. And I know there are many others out there, like me, who are then left to pick up the pieces and move on. So I do hope that I can be a voice of encouragement for someone to no longer be silent. If you know someone who has experienced sexual trauma, please be a listening ear for them, an upliftment a word, give them a word of encouragement, just be a support system for them. Sometimes I know we think we want to fix things for people, but what I found out is that a lot of times an individual doesn't want to be fixed. They want to be heard and understood, and that can be a great help. Thank you for sharing, Natasha. I'm so glad that you can be here to talk about your empowerment journey. Just to set the intention for this episode, Natasha is a sexual assault survivor, and she is here, ready, and willing to share her story and how she was able to cope and recover from this traumatic situation. So, Natasha, would you like to share a little bit about your story? So, Hannah, I want to change a couple of words that you just yep. mentioned previously, and those words would be survivor and recover. And the reason I want to change those words are that for me personally, I see myself as um, a living testament that mm-hmm. basically tells about the goodness of God and what he's done for me um, and helping me move forward in this journey of overcoming daily thoughts or flashbacks, um, taking me out of you know wanting to commit suicide. So I, I, I see myself more than a survivor. And to say recover, I am not or I have not fully recovered from it. It's about coping mechanisms or coping strategies that help us move on daily. Because I don't see myself as going back to that pure, innocent, you know, childlike person I was before um, I was sexually assaulted. So I just wanted to kind of address that first. But um, in that kind of, um, and secondly, I was self-insure my story. I was born in Trinidad. Um, I'm the seven of... (laughs) Of the youngest, actually, sorry, of seven children. And um, as early as five years old, I can remember having all of my other siblings be away from the home and my parents having to go out. And I was left in the care of an older 
teenage half brother who sought this as his opportunity to, I guess, fulfill his sexual desires or urges. And um, that's when my uh, trauma started for me. I was sexually violated. What's really interesting about the mind in these traumatic situations is how we process them. After it happened, what was your acute response to the assault? And when I say acute, this is for our listeners, what that's asking is what was your immediate short-term reaction to the assault 24 to 72 hours after it happened, considering that you were a child at the time? How did you process it? What were you thinking? Did you know that it was an assault? Great question. Thank you. Um, I was very fearful when it happened. Um, I became anxious. I was very confused that asking myself, is this what happens with people who are supposed to love and protect you? I started thinking, is this going to happen again every time I'm left with someone other than my parents? You know, so there was just kind of a whole lot of um, emotion, but I really didn't know or at that age to say, well, okay, this happened. I knew it was wrong. Um, I just couldn't pinpoint to tell you, okay, well, what that those words, sexually abused or sexually molested or sexually assaulted happened at that time at five years old, but there was a whole lot of confusion going on in my mind. I can tell you that. You said you were five years old. That is such a young age because technically, like in my mind, you're still like a, like you're a baby, like you're growing, you're learning. And at its core, sexual assault is a violation of boundaries. Because of the overstepping of boundaries, it is hard for some survivors to identify, as you said, the experience as a sexual assault, especially if it is a loved one and it's someone that you grew up with someone that you were around all the time and as you said you saw this person as a brother right well, and then it was <laughs> oh it was a brother okay so an older, as brother, my older my older half brother your older half brother, brother. Mm-hmm. exactly so you're seeing this person as this is my brother this is someone who loves and cares about me and who wants to protect me so you were five at the time were those boundaries blurred for you when it happened or was it clear that a boundary had been violated even though you were such a young age well being raised in a culture where i really wasn't taught about you know not allowing people to touch you in in such a manner or you know being learned about your specific body parts and, and and learning about personal space and you know letting not let allowing people to enter into those personal spaces um in addition to of being raised where, you know, your older siblings and even people in the community, you have to respect them and that they can even discipline you with spanking, you know. So in, in having and not, you know, having being raised in, 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 with, with all those thoughts, it's again, at five years old, you're confused. So again, I knew it felt wrong. I knew it didn't feel right, but I didn't know what to say about it. I didn't know how to say what happened or who to tell what happened that something even, you know, so drastic happened to me, you know. So and then also being being told, don't say anything, you know, um, and that just kind of later perpetuated, you know, the, the incidents from occurring, you know, the, what occurring. And um, it just stemmed into a spiral. I just into a whole a lot of more confusion and more negative emotions that pushed me into considering suicide, which I'll I'll talk about later. Yeah, it's those things were just, um, it was, it's just a whole gamut of emotions you go through. Natasha, I can also attest to the cultural aspect of it. For our audience, Natasha and I are basically like sisters. She's from Trinidad, I'm from Guyana. So the culture, I completely understand because it's the same culture that I was raised in. You weren't taught these things. You didn't know that it happened. So back and you know, you know, always you know, just be respectful. To be respectful, especially of your elders, because Correct. that's how you're raised. You're raised with this mentality that they're older, they know they're more wiser than you are. Mm-hmm. They know things and you should listen to them. Right. So I think people take advantage of those, you know, 
those things and um sadly kind of you know stems into incidences like this that occur a lot that exactly. we don't hear of exactly exactly so natasha what it happened when you were five and you explained how you went through this period where you wanted to commit suicide you were depressed you there were so many different emotions and you didn't know how to handle it so how old were you when you realized that what happened to me was a sexual assault and what was your process of acknowledging that what happened to me is not normal what happened to me shouldn't have happened and what was your process of acknowledging that i am now a living testimony of someone who was sexually assaulted. And I know that's a lot of questions, so please take your time to process and to answer, and we're here to listen. So um, it actually took a while, some time for me to kind of realize, because um, I'll give you some more insight into my experience. Yeah, so please, thank you. With that, starting with, with my brother, and I felt like later on now as an adult, I can say that, and I think I've shared it with, um, with, with others, that. I felt that he broke down the fort, you know, for me and kind of just allowed others in to the gateway because when I became um, older, still a little girl, but by a couple years older, I experienced the same thing again with two other teenage neighbors in the community. And at that point, you know, again, it just kind of heightened my desire to just take myself out of this world because you know what is it about a little girl is so enticing you know this is you know these, these are my thoughts um so I struggled a lot with but you know again not saying anything because at that point it's like you know you kind of remove yourself and it's like okay yes this is the norm <laughs> you know um and just again carried a secret for years and years which just spiraled me into feeling just so ashamed, more ashamed, more guilty, maybe it's something that I'm doing um, that's causing them to, or causing people to, you know, want to do this to me. But I just wasn't comfortable and didn't know how as a little girl to come forward and say, hey, mom, dad, you know, or even to another family member that this is happening to me. I just didn't know how. And it may sound crazy, but I didn't know how. So it wasn't until like, you know, later years, what really um, kind of, I, I think I've suppressed a lot of those feelings and emotions that I grew up, but I found myself fighting a lot during elementary school. I fought a lot. And I realized later on that in my fighting, that it was me kind of trying a way to protect myself, which I couldn't do then. So I'm projecting a lot of my anger that I held within because I could not back then so now if anyone did anything to me or my age or a little older that I felt like I could stand up against I was fighting a lot but knew, no one knew why you know um, so I carried all that for years and then later on when I had my daughter a lot of the memories that would come back from time to time but I kind of pushed it aside and moved moved on with my, you know, with school and work and other things. After having my daughter, those memories came flooding back. And I became an emotional wreck. Because just the thought of thinking um, the possibility of this happening to her. And I had said to myself years ago, after having her, if anyone had violated her in any manner like that, I would go to another jail. I had definitely, you know, made up in my mind. So later on, after coming to know the Lord and accepting God and, and seeing his goodness and what he's done for me, um, I had to ask forgiveness and thank him, you know, for understanding that, you know, I can't go that route and distrust and put her in, um, under his wings, put my children under his wings that no one will ever um, do that to them. And I won't allow. It. So I was very overprotective. And I think today I still am <laughs> an overprotective mother, although my children are adults. Uh, so uh, later on, um, I met a friend from church, and he's a social worker. 
um, we became really acquainted, just talked about anything, having discussed the Bible, um, and that, and when he was the one I kind of shared with my experience, um, a lot of tears, a lot of, you know, just came pouring down. But it, because of his experience um, and being able to listen, um, just being able to allow me to express myself, he was really a helpful person and helping me to come out as an adult and just tell, you know, what has happened as a, as a child. Wow. I'm listening to your story and my heart is like reaching out to you as a five-year-old. And then again, as you know, you said a couple years later, it happened again with two other people in the neighborhood. So there was this pattern of where mm -hmm. that's what you were experiencing. So from five to how old were you when you actually expressed and told your story to someone? I did mention it to my daughter's father at the time. We weren't married as yet, but I did mention it to him, like I said, after having her. Right. I don't think he was even ready to, to to hear something like that. But at least I was able to express what I was feeling. But as far as like having someone to kind of guide me through and allow me to express and kind of yeah. give me that support, um, I would say my friend the social worker. And um, I, I was already an adult. I was um, in my late 20s. Wow. So it was like 15 years. At least later. Yeah. before you felt like I need to come forward. So for 15 years, you were holding on to so much pain, so much grief, to so pain. much emotions, yeah. shame, embarrassment. Mm -hmm. And did you ever tell your parents what happened? All right. So my friend who was a social worker, um, after we sat down um, and I told him, he asked me the same question you just asked me now, have you told your family? And I said, no, and I want to tell him, but I still don't know how. How to? How do you come about and say something like that? You know, um, maybe I don't know. I'm so afraid maybe of not being believed or you mm -hmm. know being heard or supported. Um, so he walked me through that. So what we did was kind of sat down. He invited, we invited my one of my older sisters who I had a really close relationship with. Yes. Um, and saw her as a mother figure in the family. Um, and she was visiting from Trinidad. Um, and so he invited myself and her over to his house one evening and he kind of, you know, said, the reason we brought you here is that, you know, Natasha wanted to share something with you, kind of to kind of initiate, you know, opening that pathway where I can tell someone at first before sitting down with an audience of people wow. um, and kind of share with her, you know, what my experience was. And then later that week, we were able to share with my other older sister and my mom um, what had happened. And what was their reaction? Were they supportive? Like, did they believe you? Like, how did you they feel? Did. They did. I have to say, they did. Okay. Um, good. My mom, it, it can tell she was very hurt. It, it was where, you know, it, one of my other sisters, um, not the not the first one we told, the second one, she asked me, why did I say something? And that, that angered me when I heard that, because I'm like, all I said to her at that time was, I was a child. I felt like I didn't have the strength. I wasn't encouraged as a child to speak up and speak out against older people um you know so to just kind of you know say so I, I guess maybe it came from you know her being also feeling for me but didn't know what to say at the time <laughs> um my mom said to me i'm all to us that you know and she said very angrily so i know she was hurting that she you know wasn't aware that he still continued with that because he had tried it in years prior with one of my, my eldest sister, the one who I told first. And she caught him and she spanked him. She gave him a beating. And that at that time, in all honesty, I felt like, well, then you didn't protect me. I didn't say to her then. But after I, we left and I started reflecting on that whole conversation, I felt like then you should have protected me even more because then you've had two girls later on and they needed to have learned okay these are your body parts and this is private and you know um no one should touch you this way and I felt like I was not protected mm -hmm. so that kind of kind of um raised another set of anger within me now mm -hmm. towards my mom and and I think 
through since then to now this. So I felt there's a little, you know, conflict going on within me <laughs> towards her. Um, that that needs to be addressed. I'll be honest with you. I have not addressed it yet, but it's yeah. Different. Wow. There's just so much emotion right now, and I'm I'm invested in the story, and I'm feeling so many different things. I'm feeling angry with you as well, because I can imagine after you tell your mom, someone who you love, and you as a mom yourself, you're thinking in terms of, I'm a mother. If I knew this happened to my child, I would, like you said, I would go to jail, because you feel like you're their protector. So In your mind, it's like, why wasn't my mom able to talk to me about these things? Why wasn't she able to protect me? And as you said, there's still a level of anger within you and conflict that still needs to be addressed with her. So it just goes to show your story. It's even though it happened when it was five, there's still so many different repercussions. It's still something that you're dealing with every single day. And I I have to ask this question with your half-brother. Have you seen him since it happened? Is he still in Trinidad? Like, yeah, he's still he still um, resides in Trinidad. Um, for years, um, haven't been raised in the, um, in the U.S. with my mom after she left, and um, and being the youngest one, she you know took me with her a year later, and haven't put phone calls being made back to you know to be in touch with the rest of the family. Every time he was on the phone, I found a way to just kind of avoid speaking with him. So I, when I had to go into the bathroom, I found myself doing something, and she would be calling me, you know, you know, oh, hey, he's on the phone, you know, wants to say hi to you. And in my mind, I'm like, how do you <laughs> do you not think that I remember, you know, or do you think that I was so young that I'd forgotten, you know, or have you forgotten, you know? Um, so I, for many years, I avoided just any type of interaction, um, and it took me years. Um, it wasn't until my father, who um, became sick from cancer, um, and then later passed away, I went back to Trinidad, but I did not stay within um, my old community. So, but yeah, later years we 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 reconnected, and because I prayed prior to that a lot, um, my relationship that I've developed with God and asking God to help me to forgive and to move forward. Yes, the memory's still there, but my reaction to seeing him or being around him, I was able to tolerate, but a part of me wanted to sit down and say, hey, talk about what happened and why, ask why. Yeah. But I I still didn't have that strength. And this is, I'm talking about, I'm already into my 40s by then. (laughs) And I still just couldn't bring myself to discuss, but our relationship, or I can, I, you know, was able to tolerate being around him. Um, he would ask me for stuff, but like money, and I would give it to him. Um, and I bought him a birthday cake. But again, all this couldn't happen. I couldn't do any of that if I did not have a relationship with God and have God in my life, mm-hmm. you know, showing me and teaching me, you know, how to move forward. So, Natasha, as you reflect and look back, I know what happened, your assault happened at a very young age. Can you remember what your life like was before the assault happened? And now that you're older, now that you've matured, how has the assault affected you in terms of how you think? For example, do you have a curfew for yourself? And also, since you have children, is there a way that you parent now or that you've noticed in your parenting style because of what happened to you? Like like you said, you're strict. You're very overprotective. Like how has the assault affected you in terms of how you live your life and how, yeah. <laughs> okay. So honestly, um, I have been and I continue to be a jovial person that I guess believe that's a personality that God has given to me. And that's something that has carried me through in spite of all the emotions that I've struggled with. I don't think anyone meeting me would be able to tell that I that happened to me because I was not someone who would stick myself in a corner and hold my head down or, you know, just um, kind of be crying all the time or shy. Or... I, I was very outgoing, very active, um, loved to have fun. 
you know, and I still do. Um, I live my life. Um, yes, I'm overprotective, like I said. I'm very hypervigilant, not just with my children, but with any children, and especially if they're under my care. <laughs> um, they, the, you know, I can easily identify myself, easily able to identify with other females who've experienced some sort of sexual trauma. I also don't trust people as easily, uh, and I don't allow myself to be vulnerable to people. Right. You know, uh, so it, even in that, with um, with my own children, at a very, very early age, some people may not agree with me, but for me, because I felt that something that I didn't have and wished I had to prevent this from happening, I educated my children a lot about sexual abuse, molestation, and what their body parts are, and no one should, you know, what boundaries about boundaries. Right. Their bodies very early. And we talk about till the day, like I said, they're young adults, and we talk about any and everything very openly. I develop with my children an, a safe haven where they can discuss anything with me. It does, didn't matter what it was or how simple they think it may be that I'm willing to listen and hear what you have. That is very beautiful that you've been able to develop this strong relationship with your children where it's like, if anything happens, I want to know about it. And you've created the space where they feel comfortable enough to tell you about it if something were to happen. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. And as you've mentioned previously, you are in a place where you have ha- you've developed a relationship with God. And because of that, you've been able to accept, you've been able to forgive your assailant. You've been able to forgive the perpetrator for doing that to you. And because now this is a part of your story. Mm -hmm. So how and when did you gain this level of confidence to, one, write a book about it, and we'll talk about this a little later on, but two, how are you able to gain this level of confidence where you can speak about such a sensitive topic? Again, it's nothing that I've developed on my own. Mm-hmm. I, I devote myself to a lot of prayer, conversations with God, and studying the Bible. And having God as a huge, and I would say, priority in my life has helped me to get where I am today. Of my own, I'll be very honest, I wouldn't be here because at, at a very early age, I didn't want to be alive. So talking about being a survivor, I didn't want to survive. I thought myself just kind of um, using objects to cut into my skin, cut my wrists. Mm. So, you know, to take, to get rid of the, the pain and the shame and the guilt and the anger that I was feeling. Or, I, you know, I, I later put thought also maybe, you know, maybe to just try to get an attention from someone that something was happening since I couldn't tell them. You know, just so that, that the abuse could stop. But I didn't have the courage <laughs> to go through with slitting my wrist. And, you know, as an adult now and knowing God, I realized that, you know, he was saying, Mm-mm, you're not going out this way. I'm here with you and I'm here for you. Um, but again, as an adult, um, back in 2005, when I um, sat down with my friend and, and we, we developed that, that action plan in sharing my story, the more. When once I told, there was a level of comfort and a burden lifted that that secret that I held on to that was holding me prisoner, it, I felt like, okay, there was a release. And so just talking about your story, just, just letting someone know, it actually helps you to heal and start moving forward. Um, so, so just kind of getting rid of that, that baggage that I carried on my, you know, that, that yeah. pushed my back for years. Um, that actually kind of helped me to get where I am today. And God has been pressed upon my heart for many years. He has shown me this kind of, I've, I've seen myself in platforms where, you know, I'm sharing this story, sharing my story. Um, mm-hmm. And I try to sh- my best to kind of shy away from it. And the more I shied away, the more I felt, you know, the nudging of God. There are others out there who need who needs to hear, who needs to know that they're, 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 there's help out there, you know. So... I'm encouraged by God to 
tell others, to talk more, to help not just others, but to help myself as I move forward in this process, in this journey, because it's a continuous daily uh, moving on um, mm-hmm. effort that it takes to mm-hmm. get from point A to point B. So it's not just miraculously, okay, you wake up in the morning and all the thoughts and the flashbacks and everything has gone away. If you carry this with you daily, but how you respond to it changes and allows you to live a joyful, happy life in Christ. So you would say that, one, developing a relationship with God, and two, talking about and expressing what happened to you, this is what also helped you not self-harm. And this is what also helped you not commit suicide. Is that what you're saying? Right. And then later on, I also um, got into counseling. And counseling has helped me a lot in my in my journey. Um, you know, just kind of identifying the feelings and dealing with what you're feeling and owning your feeling and knowing that, you know, you're not wrong for what you're feeling. And, you know, you're not a bad person, you know, but these things have occurred. Um, and they, they, you know, they need to be addressed and it's a safe place and someone who's professionally skilled in helping you move through that process. Right. As you say, but- Natasha, this is something that you deal with every day and how you choose to respond to it is something that you're learning every single day because one, you're walking with God and two, you're learning to process, to accept, to acknowledge what happened, but move forward in the healthiest And in a way, the most positive way that you can. As we know, and as you're aware, trauma is never forgotten, nor does it go away. Everyone has their own healing journey. We know that the abuse happened when you were five and that you've done a lot of work to build a life worth living. What would you say is your next step in your healing journey? To further promote my healing along my journey, God has impressed upon my heart to help others who are struggling and don't know where or who to turn to by speaking out, reminding men and women that they have a voice. They are not alone. They are valuable. And regarding my feelings, I think of how different it may have been had I told when the abuse first happened. Losing that choice of who I rendered my virginity to or when. And yes, I I still do have feelings of anger. I cry at times. However, The frequency and how I cry is now different than previous years. Thank you, Natasha. One of the skills and techniques that we teach here at the Victim Service Center is mindfulness and meditation. Are there any practices or techniques that have helped you get to where you are as well? Yeah, for sure. Well, outside of the Bible, and I'm praying a lot, and um, I've talked to God a lot, so you'll hear me just kind of repeat that, because honestly, that... Well, that's that's fine. For sure. (laughs) Um, but one of the things I do, um, I, I affirm myself, um, I don't seek external validation from people. The Bible says in Philippians 4.13 that I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I believe that. I believe that he wants more for me. Um, I think of myself as being strong, as, as courageous, as confident. And I know that I am. Um, and, you know, so having gone through um, sexual trauma, you, you tend to see, let me speak for myself. I saw myself as not, could not be valued or just kind of feeling that, you know, I'm less than, but I'm not, you know, um, and I use a lot of my, you know, uh, my intelligence that God has given to me, um, but, you know, my education as, as, as an opportunity to rise above what has happened and to know that I can become someone, I can, you know, I can do more and I can be better and not allow myself to wallow in what, what happened, but live to my fullest. Exactly. And Natasha, you are such a beautiful soul. Even speaking with you, I feel your energy. I feel your passion. And yeah, I admire you so much. I I believe I'm worthy. I'm worthy. You are. And I deserve to experience God's joy every day. So I wake up every day with a positive attitude. I wake up every day believing that, you know, you know how we tend to say, oh my gosh, what a bad day. For me, I tell myself, the day that God has created and given me the opportunity to live within is not a bad day. Circumstances within that day, maybe a little wishy-washy, yeah. but the day itself and is, is great, and I'm going to make the best of it, and I deserve to be in that day. 
That's that's amazing. And that's a great mindset to have. Thank you. What advice would you give to a survivor who may be listening? Yeah, so sexual abuse or sexual trauma is pervasive and it affects various aspects of someone's life. Your friendships, your marriage, your parenting skills, and many other areas. Typically, they're, they're triggers and they stimulate emotions and responses. If someone could identify those and work on improving how you choose to respond, it's helpful. For example, one of mine is whenever I think or feel someone has placed a demand on me that I'm not ready to deal with at that time, I become defensive. I'm still learning to become aware that my thoughts or feelings of that situation may be incorrect and not to associate the present occurrence with my past experiences because that that's really not helpful it it can actually be a little you know dangerous for you and how you relate to other people and in that i'm going to include redeem your power because the emotional weight of the shame the anger the pain and the guilt all of that could spiral any one of us downward into self-pity but you can't defend yourself or help anyone else if you're poised in a position where you where you're being trampled upon Thank you, Natasha. That's beautiful advice. The last thing that I want to ask you before we end this episode is I know previously in our conversation, you said that you wrote a book and this is something that is a part of your healing process because in sharing it, you're sharing that you are a living testimony. So can you tell us more about it? When it's going to come out? When can we expect to pre-order it? Tell us the details. (laughs) Thank you, Hannah, for that. Um, yeah, so the title of my book um, is Steps of Mercy, Ladder of Grace, um, and that is currently um, going through publishing, and we're looking at early uh, 2023. I don't yet have a projected date um, for that, but uh, later on, if Hannah will have me back. Of course can- I will. Is that even a question? We can definitely sit down and share. Um, I can give you more insight about the book, um, and it, it's a lot of, again, my journey where I went through what I went through um, and what God has done for me and what he can do for you. Um, there's some, also some resources within the book of you know where people can find help or seek help. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's basically um what so once once it's once we're ready, I can share a lot more about it um, and kind of tell you where you can find it and the platforms in which they can be found and purchased. So everyone can be a part of the joy, the blessing. Thank you. Perfect. Natasha, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much for sharing how you were able to take back your power. And you said that you were able to do this by one, developing a relationship with God, two, sharing your story, talking with other people, because you said that it was other people who helped you be able to overcome this traumatic situation. And Talking to you, I can see that you're thriving. You have regained power and control back in your life. I'm so proud of you. And I'm so happy to be able to sit here in this space and have you share your story and just be able to listen to it. So thank you once again for taking the time to be here, Natasha. I appreciate you more than you could ever know. It's, it's my pleasure. <laughs> and I just um, want to say also uh, thank you for allowing me to um, share my experience, my story on this platform. And I also want to encourage people, I don't want anyone who's who's listening to go away thinking that I've arrived at this place of bliss rapidly because it surely takes time and conscious effort to not be or become that person that all these, um, this experience could cause you to be, an ugly person. You're not an ugly person, you're a good person. There's a lot of good in you, so find and identify the goodness, the good things about you that God has created, and um, let those just kind of shine. The Victim Service Center is a nonprofit organization that provides free confidential counseling services for victims of any kind of trauma in Central Florida. The views and opinions expressed by podcast participants are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Victim Service Center of Central Florida. 
This podcast content is made available for informational and educational purposes, and the VSC does not make any representation or warranties with respect to the accuracy or completeness of the content. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or corrections of error. To learn more about our services, please visit victimservicecenter.org. And to everyone listening, healing is not linear and you are not alone.